Welcome to Section 7, Processing Natural Language in Spark. In the previous section, we explored and set ourselves up for building a streaming sentiment analysis solution using natural language processing and Spark streaming. In this section, we will continue this journey to a streaming sentiment analysis solution. In the first video, we will start our data cleaning process by taking the findings from the acquire phase of the previous section and applying those to the data set that we prepared. No natural language processing is complete without understanding regular expressions, so we will also briefly explore that topic. Then in the second video, data cleaning and transformation, we will finish off our data cleaning process by applying Spark SQL functions and regular expressions on our data set. And finally, we will round off this section with the third and fourth videos where we will actually be training a sentiment analysis model pipeline. By the end of this section, you will have a thorough understanding on how to wrangle and clean data for use with a natural language application, as well as understanding how regex works in Spark. We will come out of this section with a pre-trained data pipeline that we will have persisted to disk for future use. Welcome to the video, data preparation and regular expressions. In this video, we will be taking the findings from our acquire phase from the previous section, and we will prepare our data by applying cleaning logic on it. And also we will explore regular expressions. Let's have another quick look at the structured approach from our first video and see where we are in our process and what we will be focusing on in this video. So our acquire and explore data step gave us the following initial findings. And I'm saying initial because usually these steps are iterative. So once you find a one way and you go through your model, you might find other things we need to do. For now, I'm going to do one cycle and any other post clean that we need to do, uh, we'll just fix that once we get to the model part, since we're just doing a proof of concept anyway. But let's see what we have found while we were exploring the data. So we found that we need to apply a proper schema. We found out what that would look like. So we're going to do that. The date column needs fixing. We saw that it was the wrong format. We will also need to extract and remove the usernames. We'll need to extract hashtags and replace them with their word equivalent. We will need to remove URLs because our algorithm won't be able to use any of that information. And the same goes for email addresses. Email addresses will also throw off algorithms later down, so we will need to remove those as well. Symbols that were stored in HTML notation, they do not appear to be properly unescaped. So we need to fix that also. And we saw that there were some unwanted characters present. Perhaps the encoding is broken. We'll have to investigate. So quite a few of these things will require the use of regular expressions. So what is a regular expression? So if you look at the dictionary notation, it's actually quite long. But what it comes down to, if I put it in layman terms, is that a regular expression is a type of pattern consisting of a sequence of characters that describes a certain amount of text. This pattern can then be used for find, extract, and replace operations within the body of text. Their name comes from the mathematical theory on which they are based. It is practically impossible to do natural language processing without using some form of regular expression. Hence, using and writing regular expressions is a good skill to master when you're doing natural language processing. In case you want or need to learn more about regular expressions, let me share some resources here. So regular expressions are usually abbreviated as regex or regexp. I like the regex form. If you are unfamiliar with regex, I encourage you to check out the regular expressions.info website that I've listed here. This site contains all that there is to know about regular expressions and has some really nice tutorials and tools listed. It also describes differences between implementation of programming languages. Python has a regular expression module that is simply called RE, and sometimes people use the regex module as well, but the RE one is the most commonly used. However, Spark uses the Java syntax for regex, as it is built on top of the JVM. And this syntax is a little bit different compared to Python's native regex style. So also this website that I've linked here, the regular expressions.info, explains the differences between these languages. So if you're familiar with Python regex, do know that the Java regex might be a little bit different. For this reason, personally, I like to use the Java regex tester found on freeformager.com. This tool gives me a good way to test my regexes as they have a compatible syntax with Spark. Anyway, we will explore more about regular expressions and how Spark does it in just a bit. So without further ado, let's jump over to our lab environment and actually get hands on with our data. So in the last video, we left off with finishing off our acquire stage. So we actually generated our raw data. Note that I've renamed our notebook from last time to acquire. This is just so that we can distinguish. So let's start our process by starting a new notebook. And I'm setting the name of this notebook to clean. That makes it handy for us. The first thing that we'll do inside of this notebook is remind ourselves what it is that we have to deal with. Additionally, we can go back to our acquire notebook and copy most of the logic that we used there. This time, however, we're not going to be using Seaborn, so I'll remove it from our scripts. We will also need to change our in path and out path. 
as now the in path becomes raw and the out path we will name clean. Also, I will rename our app to data cleaning because obviously we are on the next stage. Okay, so this sets us up. So a lot of it is just copy pasting. We don't have to go from scratch. What I'd like to do, however, before we start loading the data is that we want to fix the date time because we saw that when we were looking at it that the, the date column was of the wrong type. So let's remind ourselves briefly what it looked like. Note that I will continue to be using the two pandas notation here as it just makes it display nicer. We're going to keep this one row on screen so we can use it as a reference point to write the rest of our logic based on. The goal of now is that we're going to write a function, which we're going to be calling the cleaning process. And inside of that cleaning process function, we will define all of our cleaning steps one by one. We should be able to feed this cleaning process a data frame and it should output back a, another data frame, but then with the cleaning logic applied to it. So we'll do that at the end. Let's first assemble our logics and see what we need to do. And then at the end, we'll assemble it all together and run it on our data. So we said we need to apply a proper schema. That was step one. So what it means is I'm going to want to change this string notation here to a timestamp. When we do that and reapply that to our data, you can actually see that it mangles things up because it's expecting a timestamp there, but it's not working. So just simply changing the type is not going to work. What we can, however, do is set a timestamp format for when we are reading it in. Now you can actually do that on our CSV here. You can simply say, we can simply add a string to it here with a proper timestamp format. Obviously, we have to determine what that looks like. What we can simply do is add the timestamp format parameter to the CSV call here. And what we need to do is we have to actually add the string of what the timestamp format looks like. So I've shared a link to this before in one of our earlier chapters. It's the simple date format from Java. So this website here explains exactly how which letter represents what in a date. So for our purposes, it looks like this. So we have EEE, -E -E, that's the, the day of the week. We have the month, and this is represented by three characters here. So it's MMM. And we have the day, the hour, the minute, the seconds. And we are dealing with a three-character time zone, the disease, and then the lowercase y's here are the year, which is in four characters. So we're applying this time time format and we rerun. We can actually see now that the date time is now fixed. So we can see that applying this timestamp format upon reading of our data will fix this issue. So let's make sure we save that in a variable and then we can just permanently apply that on our reader. There, that's step one done. We now have a proper timestamp set and with a proper schema. So we did step one and step two. We now have a proper schema set and we now have the fixed to date column. Next is that we were going to need to extract and remove usernames. I'm going to leave this one row up here on screen so that way we have a reference point. Let's look at about 10 to 20 rows of data to see what we're actually dealing with. Okay, I'm looking at 20 rows of data here. What we can see is that there are user mentions here and there's, let's see if there's any more. Yeah, there's one down here. There's one here and there's one here. But I do wonder if there's user mentions where there's more than one inside of the text. So let's actually see that to make our life a little easier. Let's just store our data frame. Let's store and cache the data frame and pass it this way. This actually makes it a little bit faster to deal with since we are having lots of data, potentially lots of data. And also we don't have to keep calling the same thing over and over. So let's look at a few more rows of data and see if we see any rows where there is more than one user mention in the text. All right, well, simply scrolling through the text, we don't see that, but we can assume that there is the possibility because there's no guideline in Twitter that says you can only have one user mention. There might be body of text in the Twitter messages here where there's more than one user mention. Now, why is this important? Well, we'll explain. Let me first show how we're going to extract a username from this. And to do that, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to set up ourselves a little test data. And with this test data, what we're going to do is I'm going to be using the free online Java regular expression test, the free formatter, which I've explained to you before, what I've mentioned before. And we're going to have to fill the entry to test against. We could simply just copy out a bunch of these rows of data, but that's not the point, right? So it's nice to 
to take some of the test cases that we can find and actually apply them inside of the application. So that way, when we write our regular expressions, we can actually see that they work. So that way we can assume that when we are applying it on our bigger data set, with the 1.6 million rows of data that we have here, that they will perform the same way since the same syntax is used within Spark. So let me switch to single document mode that gives me just a little bit more room to work with. So what I've done off screen is analyze this data before, and I've taken a, quite a few test cases, some of the Twitter text messages taken from this corpus of data that we have. And I've also added a few things for myself. So some URLs to test with, some email addresses to test with, some really weird long email addresses that might cure, and all sorts of ways to write URLs. These are our test cases that we can use to do the cleaning steps that we need. Since we mentioned that we're going to not just have to extract the usernames, which we're going to start with, but we'll also have to, of course, make sure we don't have any email addresses or URLs or even the hashtags wrongly in our corpus of data. So this is the test data that we're going to be using. What I'll do is I'll head over to our expression tester in here and add it in here. So this will be what we will be testing with. It's the same as, as what I have just showed you in our lab environment. So let's just start with regular expressions. And the first thing we'll do is we will extract usernames and then I'll show you how to remove usernames. So I'm not going to give a crash course on regular expressions. You can do that on your own time. There's a, a lot of resources to be found, even linked on this website. But the regular expression to do usernames looks like this. So what we're doing is we're providing an at sign followed by up to 15 characters. And why 15 characters? Well, if you look at the Twitter website, it literally reads that your username cannot be longer than 15 characters, and a username can only contain alphanumeric characters. So the backslash W means an alphanumeric character. This is the exact character set that we need, the letters A through Z and the numbers zero to nine, and it can be of any case, so lowercase or uppercase, it doesn't matter. So this is the perfect way for us to find usernames. So let's run it and see what happens. There we go. So now we run test match, and you can actually see, like highlighting green, that it's accurately getting our usernames, but it does come with one side effect, which is that it will also find the at sign in emails. So the proper thing to do, since we don't need emails, so we could fix this by making our regular expression more complicated, but the proper thing to do here is instead of doing that, is to first remove the email addresses. So let's make sure we store this regular expression since we're going to need it, and we'll get back to that in just a moment. And note that I'm putting R in front of the strings that I'm making, and this is to make sure it's a real notation so that you don't have to worry about the limitation characters like backslashes, because else it can throw you right off, because that's gonna be a problem. So on the store the user regex, we just know that we're gonna to have to do the ones for email and the other first, but let's go step by step. Next up is hashtag. The hashtag actually looks awful lot like a username. It's just a little different. So let's get over back to our tester again. Our hashtags look like this. So we want a hashtag followed by at least one alphanumeric character, because there's a hashtag can also only be alphanumeric characters. And we want any length. So at least one, but any length. So now if you run this, then we see that we are correctly getting all the hashtags back. All right, awesome. That's what we need. It's also finding hits inside of URLs. So this is also telling me that instead of making it more complicated in this regex, if we are good enough if we just remove URLs first. Okay, so we're gonna have to make sure that our order of operations is correct. All right, next up, URLs. Like the other regular expressions, I also prepared this one off screen. This one is actually quite complicated. It is a multi-mode regular expression, so it has multiple selections. If you feel like it, make sure you study what's going on. But when I run it, you can see that it is correctly finding the URLs that I've specified here in my test data set. So even the complicated Spark Apache Org Docs URL with all the hashtags and everything are being found. So that means that if I run this URL finder regex against my corpus of data, I can then strip away these URLs and make sure that the data is clean. And when we run this first and we'll find one for email, then we can run the others and make sure that we clean up behind ourselves. Okay, so let's store this one as well. And next up, emails. Like before, this one I have also prepared ahead of time off screen. And with this regular expression, which is shown here, you can see we're again dealing with alphanumeric characters and what is allowed inside of email addresses. And we're finding an at sign. And then if you run this, you can actually see that it is finding even the most complicated email address that I could come up with with a domain with too many dots and underscores. 
is still being found. So this means that we have our email addresses as well. All right, cool. This gives us four regular expressions to deal with. I feel this is a good spot to end for now. So let's recap what we've learned so far. We got to start our cleaning process. And we also briefly explored regular expressions. So if you want to familiarize yourself with regex and how it works, please use the resources that I have linked before. I will put them back on the screen for you. So feel free to pause the course here and explore this further, if you so wish.